Okay, let's go. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mario Cruz, the Maker Fair producer of Miami. Uh, thank you for joining us at the Miami Maker Fair virtual event. Uh, today, our, our guest is uh, Ali Weber. She, you might know her from Mythbusters Jr. You might know her from uh, uh, her, her channels and her and social media. Uh, again, she also did this thing um, this, this summer about having kids make stuff at home. Um, so uh, that was a great, great thing she has done. She's gonna be showcasing today her Rubik's Arcade bot. Uh, so Ali, it's all yours. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my name is Ali Weber and I am 15 and I am from South Dakota. I am a maker, builder and inventor. And in my free time, I just like to make things that are uh, really fun to play with. Um, so mostly what I want to do with this talk is uh, mostly have it as a Q&A, just so I can get to know you guys uh, as an audience and be able to talk a little bit about that. So I'm just going to go over it, uh, my Rubik's Arcade bot a little bit, and then you can guys ask as many questions as you want, and we'll see how many we can get to. So this is my Rubik's Arcade bot, and it is powered by a Lego Mindstorms uh, robotics kit. And basically what it is, is it is an arcade machine that allows you to manipulate a Rubik's Cube without using your hands. So, like this. And uh, the idea for this kind of came from um, when I was younger, I wanted to build a Rubik's solving uh, Rubik's bot. So a Rubik's Cube solving bot um, with my Lego League team because I saw a bunch of Mindstorms projects like that but I didn't necessarily want it to just solve the Rubik's Cube. I wanted you to be able to make it a lot harder for you to solve the Rubik's Cube uh, because uh, a lot of machines can solve a Rubik's Cube, but not many make it harder for you to. Uh, I learned how to solve a Rubik's Cube when I was in about fifth grade. And uh, ever since I learned how to solve it, uh, the mystery was kind of, you know, gone for me. Like, oh, I can solve this. You know, I can do some patterns within stuff, but there isn't really much else to do. So I wanted to come up with a way to make it more complicated and uh, tricks your brain into thinking way harder about doing something uh, that you should be able to do fairly easily just with your hands. So it adds those extra steps and it makes it really interesting to uh, think about. Um, I used uh, a black light on the inside too to make it light up and really uh, make the colors on the inside pop. And uh, Overall, it's a pretty fun project. I actually came up with the idea for this project uh, before quarantine and COVID hit um, I, for Miami Maker Fair uh, in person. But unfortunately, uh, this project was designed for people to, you know, play with and interact with the cube and uh, be really, you know, uh, hands on with it. Um, and unfortunately, it can't be super hands on anymore just because, you know, if everybody's touching one thing, then germ spread, probably not a good idea. So at least I get to share it with you guys here and uh, have this project here and hopefully I'll be able to bring it to future maker fairs as well. So yeah, that's my project. If you have any questions about that, uh, you can feel free to ask them. I also have, I'm sure most of you have seen the video beforehand, so that goes really in depth about it. Um, but that's mostly what I wanted to highlight about it as we're starting. So have you been able to solve the Rubik's Cube using your bot already? So I haven't actually been able to solve it physically with the bot just because it only has three things that you can do with it. So you can, um, so you can, wait, that button isn't working for some reason right now. Um, you can, I might need to reset the code on that, but you can rotate the Rubik's cube. Uh, you can flip the cube over or you can flip the cube over and turn one of the sides. So um, there's only three ways you can do it, whereas if it's just in your hands, you can move it any way you want to. So it makes you think a lot about, you know, the sequence of things and how you want to do it, how you flip it over and stuff. I have gotten the Rubik's Cube to be able to do uh, things like flower power, where it has the middle switched out like this, or checkerboard, where it has the edges and the middle switched out. Um, so it's just a learning curve to see how much patience you have <laughs> with when something goes wrong and also uh, how long you're willing to keep at it. So, yeah. How long did it take you to, to, to the project from beginning to end? So how long did the project take from start to finish? Sorry. So I started this project uh, around the end of Christmas break, so about January. And uh, I was working on it for a few months uh, around that time. So I think about uh, two or three months, but, you know, that was with long breaks in the middle for waiting for things to ship and 
stuff like that. So uh, once I got all the parts, if I had them all together and actually worked on it every day for a while, it probably would have taken me closer to a couple of weeks. But just because I like to string out my longer projects uh, longer than that, so I don't get bored with them, then uh, it took quite a bit longer, but I'm really pleased with the result. Did you design any 3D printed parts for your build? Unfortunately, no. I was I was planning on using a, a bunch of different because for this project I wanted to use as many different types of media as I could, basically, or mediums. I don't know how you say that. As many different kinds of engineering, I guess, uh, in this project as I could. So um, I got the uh, programming of the Rubik spot. I got the Legos. I got the building aspect of it. I've got the woodworking part for the edges on the inside and the cutting of the plastic and all that. And uh, I got soldering for the buttons and electronics on that side of things. Uh, I wanted to include 3D printing in my original design. It had 3D printing, but in the end, I didn't get to that. Um, so hopefully in the future, if I ever make changes to it, I will add stuff like that to it and see how many things I can add on. I guess a uh, question for me is, I know you had to modify um, the Lego Mindstorm sort of connectors. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, the original buttons, uh, the touch sensors that come with the LEGO Mindstorms kit, uh, they're really like not very good to look at, I guess, aesthetically. Um, they're kind of gross and they're orange and big and square. And I wanted to really use arcade buttons because that's the main part of an arcade box is the buttons, right? So um, I wanted to be sure to include that. And when I first looked it up online, uh, how to change the buttons on a on a, a Lego Mindstorms kit? Then they said, "Oh yeah, it's just a normal button. Uh, you can use basically any kind of you know touch button, and it should work." And that was definitely not correct. <laughs> so I ended up having to look up other schematics online, and it turns out there's a bunch of other resistors in there that I wasn't expecting, and they just made it overly complicated to connect your own. So I ended up including that schematic in the video if you want to check it out. Um, but eventually I did get those buttons hooked up and they work well now. So, yeah. Uh, another question. Are you working on any projects currently? Are you trying to finish? Currently, I, well, I'm always working on a project, uh, sometimes multiple at once. Right now, I guess the biggest thing that I'm working on is I want to build um, for my birthday this year, I didn't really ask for anything except for wood to build a TARDIS for my room from Doctor Who. And uh, I need to make it, it's not going to be full size because it actually needs to fit in the corner of my room, but uh, it's going to be pretty big, big enough to stand in. And I'm planning on bringing it to Comic Cons and stuff. And hopefully I'll have that done sometime soon. But um, I'm just working on that right now on the woodworking skills. I really enjoy woodworking. So that's something that I don't get to do very often that I'm wanting to work on. And I'm also thinking about doing uh, more things with uh, electronics on the inside. So this is an Adafruit trellis and I'm planning on putting this on the inside. Uh, since the TARDIS is supposed to be bigger on the inside and I can't really do that with wood and just stuff that I have around, then I wanted to include electronics that when you press buttons then it could uh, play the soundtrack or sound effects from the show and maybe even do like a coordinated light system on the inside that could possibly uh, light up on the inside and do all that sort of thing. So that's really what I'm working on right now. Definitely the wishes. We need the wishes. So we need to yes, go yes. And get the wishes. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is the hack of pumpkins challenge? I don't even know what that, does that mean something to you? Yes. Okay. So the hack of pumpkin challenge is an annual challenge that I do every year. Uh, it started about, I want to say about four years ago. I'm not sure which one we're on now. Um, but every year I host an online challenge where you just hack a pumpkin. It doesn't have to be, it can be basically anything. Like you can paint a pumpkin, you can carve a pumpkin, you can add electronics to a pumpkin, make it into a fun project. Just if you do anything with a project, you're hacking, or with a pumpkin, then you're hacking the pumpkin. So I always encourage people to be creative with their pumpkins and hack the pumpkins and post it on social media with the hashtag hack a pumpkin challenge. And then uh, everybody can share their amazing pumpkins. And it's a really cool annual thing that I hold every year. And uh, so far we've gotten some amazing submissions. It's crazy and it blows my mind every year when I see how many amazing pumpkins people make. And uh, it's just something that really brings making into the Halloween season. Awesome. I'll ask you a question Elijah got yesterday is, <laughs> can you talk about your Miss Tessa Jr. experience and yes. any skills you learned on the set? Oh my gosh, I learned so many skills on the set of Mythbusters. That was one of the most amazing summers of my life. Um, I learned a lot about talking to camera. 
and being able to say things very clearly and um, explain things to people. I also learned about uh, how to move really heavy objects with a forklift. I didn't drive the forklift, but I helped move the objects. So that was fun. And I also learned a lot about farts, which was kind of disgusting, but also very interesting, I suppose. And uh, I learned a lot about teamwork and being able to interact with all the other people on my team. The number one thing I was worried about going into Mythbusters was that I wouldn't get along with the other kids on the show and then I just have to deal with them for the rest of the summer. But it turns out from the first moment that I actually met all of them, then uh, we really just clicked and we got along. It was like a family the entire time. And I really miss those guys all the time. We still talk, but um, yeah, that was just one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Was there any safety things you had to learn? I know I just talked yesterday about some of the safety things like his hoodie you had the drop yes. thing, so they made him okay. pick up his hoodie. Is there anything like that you want to talk about? Yes. So um, our one of our main safety coordinators was actually Sophie Wong, and I have a panel with her later. She is doing a couple of talks. Uh, she's a really awesome lady, but um, she would always be kind of like the set mom. She would always, you know, follow us around, make sure we weren't doing anything dangerous, make sure we didn't have drawstrings on our uh, hoodies just so that they wouldn't get caught and stuff. Uh, make sure that our shoes were tied. One time I was supposed to be riding a bike to pull um, a Jenga block out from under a Jenga tower, like with a rope. It was a really fun day. Um, but I was a little worried about riding the bike. And then Sophie Wong said, oh, let's just uh, give you more safety uh, precautions then. So I wore knee pads under my jeans, elbow pads, um, safety glasses, a helmet, and like other stuff. And by the end of it, I could like barely even ride the bike because I was just so covered in stuff. But I was definitely very safe. I felt very safe. So that's one of the things. They, safety was always really big on that set. I guess somebody asked, were you able to take any props from Miss Pleasures Jr.? Did you keep yes. any props? Yes. I, I, <laughs> I took a lot of things actually. Um, so uh, one of the projects that we got to do uh, for Mythbusters Jr. was to shoot uh, an arrow through 12 axe heads. And so they actually made 12 axes for the show. And uh, I got to take one home. So that's, that's it there. <laughs> it was, I, I was struggling with figuring out how to get it home since I couldn't take it on the airplane with me, obviously. So <laughs> um, that was kind of an issue, but I ended up having it shipped home and I still have it at my house. I also uh, got rubber we all got rubber chickens <laughs> um from the set of mythbusters these actually ruined a lot of takes because um adam brought all these on the set from his duck bomb video and um we uh they had these just lying around all over set and it ruined a lot of takes because a lot of people would just keep messing with them in the middle of takes and you just hear like somebody trying to do room tone or something with the microphones and make sure we had good audio quality. And then you just hear like a screaming chicken from across the room. And um, it was it was really hilarious. There's actually one version of the show where they, uh, I don't know if it was in the American version, but they, we, they have footage of us like bowling these chickens. Like we took a bowling ball and we set up all these rubber chickens and then we pulled them over with the bowling ball and they were just screaming and flying. It was hilarious. So yeah, rubber chickens were probably one of the most fun things on the show. And I also got a piece of, uh, well, a roll of duct tape from the duct tape special and uh, just a lot of other things that were super fun. How was it working with Adam Savage? Adam is hilarious. He's like a little kid all the time. He's so excitable and uh, he's really enthusiastic about any project that you do. And he's a really good leader at the same time. So he's really easy to follow and he always makes you laugh. Like his sense of humor on, on the show is like a kindergartner, but it's hilarious because he's like that all the time. And he's always just has so much energy. And uh, he's almost exactly the same on camera as he is off camera. So he's really just a great guy. I guess what here's another question is, um, is there any way to watch Miss Buster Jr. other than Hulu? Yes. So all of the episodes are actually now for free on YouTube on the Science Channel. So, or the Science Channel's YouTube channel, I guess. So uh, if you want to look at them, all the full episodes are online. Uh, they're really fun. They're all listed there. They even have some um, shorts. If you don't want to watch the whole episode, then they have other ones. And uh, it's just, it's really cool. Okay. So what we'll do is after the, when we post Ali's video later, in the chat, I'll put links to the Mythbuster Junior uh, YouTube channels and all of her social media places so you can follow her. Yes.
Okay, I guess the next question here is, um, I know that you did the, the, the mask video, so I want to just a little bit talk about the mask video. I shared that my wife's a school teacher, I have kids, I have small kids too, so can yes, you talk about yeah. your mask video and why, and why you did it? Yeah, so um, actually uh, I saw even the people who worked for my school district, they weren't wearing masks correctly and uh, would keep touching their masks in public and stuff and they clearly weren't the right size. And so it was really painful to watch kind of. Um, so I figured, you know, schools are going to need to know this if we're going to go back to school and uh, everybody needs to wear masks, then we're going to have to, you know, come up with some guidelines as to how you do that in school and how to do that safely because not everybody knows and not everybody uh, is able to, you know, tell other people how to wear their masks for fear of, you know, like, oh, that's wrong, you know, <laughs> just uh, being made fun of. So I wanted to make a video that showed, you know, how to wear your mask officially and uh, following CDC guidelines, you know, being healthy and making good choices in school. And I figured that uh, it should be easy enough for younger kids to understand and people could watch in classrooms. So it's nice and short. Uh, so yeah, it's just a nice video about how to wear your mask correctly and what to do if it doesn't fit. And uh, yeah, so if you wanna use it in your classrooms or just show your kids for back to school season, be great. I see Andrea's also watching this uh, as an attendee and she gets this question a lot and Sophie gets this question a lot. What is it like being a woman in STEM and how do you feel about that and how we can get more women in STEM? So I have been actually very fortunate to not have, um, you know, come across that much discrimination because of my gender. I feel like since I'm younger, then it's much more open. Uh, I've faced a lot of discrimination because I am a younger kid and people underestimate me a lot, um, but I haven't really, you know, gotten, you know, that much, uh, come across that many problems because I was, you know, a girl in STEM. Uh, one thing that does always come to mind is that I was the only girl on my Lego League team, and uh, which was perfectly fine with me. I didn't mind being with a bunch of boys, but um, I feel like it's really important to have representation in STEM because even if it isn't a problem for me, then it should be able to, you know, not limit other people from coming into the STEM field and being able to do what they want to do and have that representation because uh, it's better to have more designers from wide backgrounds who can connect with, you know, their audience than just one type of person who's designing for everybody, you know? So having different perspectives is really important and that's why I support women in STEM. And this is a follow-up question for me is, uh, I love your tweet that you have pinned, which is kids are not the future, we're here now. And we're not going to change that in the world someday, we're gonna change it now. Can you talk about that? That's, that's one of my favorite things uh, about you. And that tweet <laughs> is when I first started following you. So I definitely want you to talk about that too. And talk about, yeah. so we're, gonna get your, we're gonna get to your patent next, but that's why I wanted to start <laughs> this thing to talk about your patent. Yeah, so um, when I was younger, I started winning a lot of invention competitions and uh, online competitions and stuff, and everybody would always compliment me, you know, just normal compliments like, oh, you're going to do so much great things someday, or when you grow up, you're going to do great things. And I'm like, well, what about what I'm doing now? Isn't that, isn't that good enough? So um, that's why I tweeted, you know, kids are not the future, we're here now, and we're not going to change the world someday, we already are, because... Uh, it sort of validates the fact that you don't have to be an adult to make a difference and, uh, you know, kids are the future and they are also today. So, yeah. So let's talk about the, the, the gloves and the patent next. So how, how does, let's, let's, let's translate that to how you got in that, how you went down that path. And then I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of follow-up questions. So first, let's talk about your patent and how you got started in the, in the glove patent. Sure. So uh, when I was in, I want to say fifth grade yeah fifth grade probably I would have been 10 or 11 um, I created an invention called the frost stoppers which is a set of temperature sensing gloves that can sense when you're about to get frostbite so you can go inside and warm up before you get frostbite and I made this invention because I did end up getting frostbite one year it wasn't very fun and I was kind of scared to go out and play in the snow because I live in South Dakota and there's a lot of snow in the winter um, so I wanted to make an invention that would make it you know safe to go outside and play for as long as you want until you know uh, you might get frostbite, so you can go inside and make sure you don't. So um, I entered that uh, invention into uh, the Spark Lab Invented Challenge online invention competition, and uh, that was the second year I entered. I won to win the patent, and uh, I ended up winning that year, uh, and one of the awards was a patent. So um, I ended up starting the patent process that year, and it took about, I want to say three around three years to get the patent like fully developed just because it takes a lot of paperwork and legal stuff and 
you know, I was, I was 10, so I didn't really know much about that process, but um, I had a great team that actually ended up developing uh, this patent for me through the competition. And uh, here it is. So yeah, I got it last summer and uh, I, it was really a dream come true for me because when I was younger, I would always read about inventors like Thomas Edison who had over a thousand US patents alone. And uh, I felt like that was kind of, you know, if you're gonna be an inventor, that's really where you wanna be is have a patent. That's where you know <laughs> that you've really made it. And so I feel like that was a dream come true for me. Um, so can you talk about that whole process? I know that when you fill out the patent, the lawyer gonna give you back some things that the patent office has rejected and you go through all these claims. Things. Yeah, can you talk yeah. a little bit about that involvement? I feel like a lot of that, uh, the team that through the competition took care of that for me. Um, they did send a couple of things just to be approved, but my parents looked through that because I didn't really know how to read lawyer. So um, I didn't really speak legal terms at that point. Um, but yeah, that, that team was really amazing and they ended up doing a lot of that for me. So I'm really grateful for that. Uh, but, you know, it does take a long time. And that's one of the things that you have to know and pay attention to is just uh, even if it does take a long time, you can, you can just keep at it if you really believe in it. So, yeah. Awesome. A question you just came in is, who's your favorite doctor? Who's my, oh, from Doctor Who. Okay, this is a really, oh my gosh. Okay, so I mostly have watched the new Doctor Who, uh, mostly. Um, I have seen a little bit of the classic Who, so I feel like my first favorite doctor would probably be Eleven. So Matt Smith, just because the bow tie, of course. And then probably Ten for Tennant. And then... Probably either nine or Tom Baker, just because I like his style. He has a lot of flair. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's a widely debated topic in our household because my brother and I have differing opinions on who's better, uh, Matt Smith or David Tennant. But uh, yeah. I have to say David Tennant because of Weeping Angels and then Matt Smith. So Yes, yes, so, okay. of course. <laughs> um, are they going to make new Miss Petra Juniors? Um, not uh so they haven't it really depends on what the network decides they haven't really told us much at this point uh but we'll see okay a question just came in what is your favorite invention my favorite invention oh goodness um well one of my favorite inventions that i made there's so many i just have like a bunch of random ones uh one of the most recent ones that i worked on that i'm probably the most proud of is um this blow dart spirometer i don't know it's kind of long so uh basically what i wanted to do is one year for christmas i got a toy blow dart gun uh for you know just with foam darts and stuff like that and i played with it all the time and uh, i don't know why i realized this i was a weird kid but i just thought to myself hey i the more that i play with this the stronger my lungs feel <laughs> and so i was like well i told my mom and she was like, oh, that must be good lung therapy then. And then I remembered uh, my grandfather who had been in the hospital for lung therapy the year before, and he always complained about how boring it was and how it was annoying to do. So I thought, hey, why not make uh, respiratory therapy more fun? So I created the blow dart spirometer that basically acts as a peak flow meter. It measures uh, your hardest and longest breath uh, from start to finish, and it maps it out um for you so that it takes uh medical accurate readings but it also allows you to uh shoot a foam dart onto a target using your breath at the same time so it makes it a lot more fun for people who are doing respiratory therapy and uh it took me the longest time because i entered that in the discovery education 3m young scientist challenge and through that i got a mentor for over the summer who helped me develop it uh my first prototype was actually made out of a pvc i got from menards and uh, just stuff I had around my house and it wasn't very accurate it wasn't very clean looking it's kind of ugly and uh, then I got a 3d printer from Joel Telling and Joseph Prusa and that was really where my world changed because I could design things a lot faster and I could make more prototypes and make things a lot more streamlined I learned about 3d designing a lot more so I'm really grateful to them for that and for uh, letting me have the printer for <laughs> using it for this project and I really learned a lot about it through that but it took a lot of time, a lot of testing, a lot of development, a lot of learning to be able to finish this project for that competition. And I feel like that's why I'm the most proud of it because it took me the most work and I was had the most setbacks out of any project that I'd had. 
Uh, but in the end, it turned out really well, and I'm really glad. And your question came in now. What interest do you think you'll pursue when you go to college? Like, what do you want to study? I have no clue, honestly. <laughs> um, I am really indecisive, and I don't know at this point, you know, what the differences between my hobbies and what I, you know, want to do as a career. So I've been really into forensics lately. I like writing. I like, uh, you know, doing TV and audiovisual things. Uh, I like engineering. I like entrepreneurial stuff. And, uh, you know, I think about, you know, I daydream about owning a business where I have a bookstore and, you know, just all sorts of things. So I have no clue where the future, what the future has uh, for me, but I'm just hoping that God takes me to the right spot. So, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned bookstore. So uh, do you have any favorite books you want to recommend? My favorite book of all time is Jurassic Park. I don't know if you can see, but I have like a ton of dinosaurs behind me. And um, I'm really obsessed with dinosaurs. I first read Jurassic Park when I was in sixth grade. And then I subsequently read it 13 more times. Um, I'm not sure. I had it memorized at one point. It was just such a good book. And it was mind blowing to me because it was scary, but it was also semi-scientific. And so I really liked how he was able to, you know, explain complex ideas in a simple to understand format that still had action and intrigue. And it was amazing. I was just so blown away by it. And I have almost every one of his books now on my shelf. Well, I guess we'll talk about that in the book. Uh, there's pterodactyls, but not in the movie. So a question came in uh, about pterodactyls asking, by any chance, have you seen a purple pterodactyl with teal undertones that tastes like <laughs> green grapes and shoots rainbows out of its eyes? Unfortunately, no, Elijah, I have not. That was another inside joke from the show. Um, Elijah, I think one of his friends from uh, New York had this inside joke at home and then Elijah would just call him all the time asking him this like at random times. Like whenever we had a break on Mythbusters, he'd call from the green room and be like, have you ever seen a purple pterodactyl with te teal undertones that tastes like green grapes that can shoot rainbows out of its eyes? One time he called him at like 3 a.m. just in the middle of the night to ask him this question and his friend got so annoyed at him for it, but it was hilarious. And so now everybody from set says it all the time. Awesome. Uh, I guess this is uh, another one just came in. Where did you get your interest in electronics? Uh, from your parents or from your friends? What got you, in, what got you started in, in building? So um, I guess I've always been immersed in engineering and electronics ever since I was really little. Uh, my dad is actually an electrical engineer and my mom is just a, a really creative person in general. Uh, she was a, a musical, how do I say this? Music teacher? I don't know. She Music education major. That's how you say it. Um, so she was really good at teaching me things and being creative and, you know, letting me do crafts projects ever since I was really little. And my dad knows the electronics side and the building and the woodworking. And so those two combined, I was really just raised in a household where building was kind of the norm. And uh, ever since then, I've been making. I guess the follow-up to that is, would you like to be uh, the next Adam Savage and just have like a build channel and show people how to do builds? <laughs> that would actually be so fun. I do have a YouTube channel right now. You can check it out. Uh, it's called Technic Alley Speaking. And it showcases some of my inventions, some how-tos, DIYs, and other fun things. So be sure to check it out. I think, uh, let me see, if anybody wants to ask Ali a question live, you can actually raise your hand and I'll try turning on the microphone. So I know that we have some, some folks that I, I recognize a lot of folks on this call. So if you guys want to ask a question, just click the, uh, you raise your hand button and, and I can try to get you to ask Ali a uh, live question. Um, I guess one of the other questions that was asked here is, uh, how did you get started on the 3D printing software? Like, how much of that design, so the, of the blow gun, how much of that design did you do yourself and what software do you use to do that? Yeah, so through school, um, we actually had a subscription to uh, Autodesk Inventor Professional, I wanna say 2010. And so I learned a little bit about that through school. And uh, we had a unit on uh, 3D design through that. So I learned a little bit about it. And then uh, when I got home, they said that I could use it at home too through the school subscription. Um, but then it turns out I had to be 13 or older. And at the time I was only 11. So I had to lie about my age. I'm sure I'm pro it's probably not illegal. But anyway, um, so I ended up getting the design software I needed to use. And uh, after a long time of, you know, designing different models and stuff with larger and smaller diameters for the tube, then I ended up with the design I have now. Um, I actually uh, recommend using Tinkercad now for starters, just because it's a lot easier 
and um, it's a lot more, I want to say just uh, better for the learning curve. Uh, for those who are just starting, that's what I recommend to, you know, uh, younger kids when I go to elementary schools to speak or middle schools. Um, but if you, you know, have the um, design capabilities, then I would go to Autodesk Inventor Professional just because uh, it isn't super hard to understand once you get started. It's just the learning process that takes a little bit of time. So, yeah. Okay, I think one of the questions came in about your Jurassic Park Jeep. I forgot to ask about that. Oh, yes, any, yes. Any, any work plan for your Jurassic Park Jeep? Okay, so um, uh, last, I want to say last summer. Last summer, time is just not good in my brain right now. Okay, so last summer, um, I, wait. Okay, actually, this is a longer story than I thought. So two summers ago, when I was at, uh, in California for Mythbusters, um, I told my dad that I wanted to get a Jeep so I could paint it like the Jurassic Park Jeep because we had an opening in our garage. We previously had a red MG convertible that I really, really loved. And then he sold it and I got really mad at him for a long time. But so I was like, okay, we need another car then if we're not going to have the, the convertible in the, in the garage. So he was like, okay, I'll look for, you know, other project cars, you know, because he does like to do a couple of projects with me with cars. And I like learning about cars because it's a good skill to know. Um, so I thought a Jurassic Park Jeep would be a great idea. And after a year of looking the next summer, uh, when we were back in South Dakota, I was gone for a church camp uh, in Colorado. And uh, my parents found the perfect Jurassic Park style Jeep that was just in uh, on the side of the road after the 4th of July parade. And they were like, yeah, we're gonna take this over, buy it and give it to Allie when she comes home. So I was just a mess after being at this camp all week and my hair was everywhere and I got this new car and I was so happy. I was almost crying. And uh, it was just one of the best days of my life. It's still one of my favorite things in the entire world. I love going on Jeep rides with my dad. Uh, what we've done with it so far is we replaced the speakers so it can actually play good music now. Um, we replaced the headlights so it's got LED headlights. Uh, we fixed one of the rear blinkers because it wasn't working and just a couple of other minor adjustments. But in the future, the really big thing that we want to do is paint it to look like the Jurassic Park Jeep. And uh, I'm really excited about how it's going to turn out once it's done. Awesome. I know you, are you, are you driving already? I know you, you, you. Yes. Okay. So um, I didn't know how to, okay. I learned how to drive last summer because I took driver's ed and then, uh, but I didn't know how to drive a stick. So I've been learning all of this summer how to drive a stick. And I think I made it all the way from my house to my grandma's house without killing it once. And that was the biggest, like, yeah, I can actually do it now <laughs> moment. So I can drive it without my dad in the car and I can, well, my mom has to be in the car still because otherwise that's illegal, but she can't actually drive it with a stick. So I can drive it kind of by myself now. So looking good. <laughs> Awesome. Um, okay, next question. Are you coding in Python or Arduino? Or what coding language do you like to use? Okay, so I personally like Arduino just because I think it's easier to understand. That's what I started with. Uh, on the Frost Stoppers, that's what I used. Um, I use Python a lot when working with Raspberry Pis. Uh, I do like using Raspberry Pi just because it's, oh, it's pretty easy to use, in my opinion, just because you have, like, the starting, you know, the startup mode and you have the, you know, something to work off of. And so that's what I like about it. Um, yeah, I, I really do both. <laughs> Is there any, any books you recommend or how did you get started on Arduino and how did you get started on the, on, on coding? So for the Arduino, um, I didn't really know much about it until I started on the uh, Frost Stoppers. And uh, when I looked up, you know, related projects about, you know, temperature sensing gloves and stuff like that, then I uh, found a couple of projects that included Arduino. And so I figured that I could just, you know, mash them together and uh, see if they would work. So um, I used the, their base codes for that project and I used a uh, design of my own and then somehow, you know, combined them to make the sensor work and, and talk with Arduino and talk with my headphones. And uh, that was really the, the biggest, you know, time that I learned. I really just jumped in and I used the annotations that they had to kind of lead me through the, pro the project. Um, but I did learn a lot about it through that. And then for Raspberry Pi, um, I worked on a lot of, you know, smaller Raspberry Pi projects like uh, 
Pimeroni. I really like their projects. They have really good Raspberry Pi projects that talk about coding and the hardware and all of them in one. And I use a lot of their projects a lot. And uh, also Elijah helps me with programming the Raspberry Pi just because he, he's very good at programming. And so I sometimes call him up for help. Um, but yeah, I learn, I learn a lot through uh, others helping me and through using others and kind of, you know, the open source community. And so being able to uh, ask others for help when you're stuck is really what the biggest thing is for me when I'm learning. Another question here from Lucia. So how did you come up with all the coding for your, your Rubik's Cube bot? So how did you modify what you saw out there and how did you do that? So what, what inspired I originally, you to do that? yeah. So I originally thought that I could just take the source code that they had and plug it in and then just take out what I didn't need and then just use that. But uh, it turns out um, I needed to completely change the Rubik's Cube uh, code because I basically started from scratch because uh, for my Rubik's Cube bot, um, the MindCuber was the original design that it was based off of. I didn't include a couple of sensors that they did just because I didn't need it to be self-solving. So I didn't need to use that many pieces. So I ended up uh, scrapping their code that they had and using just uh, my own code where I had it set for each button. You know, this one, it turns the arm and it rotates it. And then when the arm comes back, then it flips it over. So, you know, uh, it was just an uh, if, if one statement, if then statement, uh, and then a couple of infinite loops that I used. And then it was pretty much done. I do have a screenshot of my code included in the video if you want to check it out. Um, but in the end, it actually didn't take as long as I thought it would to program, so I'm really pleased with it. Awesome. And I guess a uh, question just came in. Do you have any tips for children wanting to start? Uh, I guess these, these folks are in the UK, so folks in the UK is like, what can they start? And I guess I asked this question to Eliza yesterday. Do you have any like um, soldering kits or any like maker kits that you, that you really loved for starters? Yes. Okay. So um, what I always recommend to when I go to schools and stuff, I have taught a couple of interims. Uh, in classes about uh, Circuit Playground, at Fruit Circuit Playground. So um, I always use them. Uh, they're really small microcontrollers, but they're really easy to uh, program. So it basically already has all the hardware on it that you need, and it has all the electronic bits and stuff, and you just plug it into your computer, and it uses uh, block programming. So kind of like Scratch, you know, like those uh, simple programming techniques. Um, but you can also translate it into stuff like uh, Python. And uh, that way it teaches kids about coding with the uh, hardware without actually having to, you know, solder, use small pieces and stuff uh, until later on. And it also has a lot of stuff packed into it and it's fairly cheap for as much uh, electronics as you get for it. So that's what I really like about it. And uh, all of the programming software is just online at makecode.com if you want to check it out. But that's what I always recommend. And then for soldering kits, I had one soldering kit. I don't remember what it was called but it was really cute. It was this little uh, Christmas tree kit that had all these red LEDs on the outside. And then you just stuck the breadboards together like that and set it on a nine volt battery and it would light up the Christmas tree. And that was my first soldering kit that I ever got. And it was, I was really pleased with it when I was done because it was just a little blinky Christmas decoration. And <laughs> it was so cute and so small and I just loved it. And so uh, I would recommend just smaller projects like that where they're really simple uh, they only require, you know, a small battery and a couple of LEDs. That's what I would start with for soldering. Awesome. I think that's all the questions. If anybody has any more questions, please type them in the Q&A inside the Zoom or the app. Um, Ali, uh, we'll, we'll give us a couple seconds here to see if anybody asks any other questions or anybody wants to raise their hand. Uh, we thank you for, for coming. Uh, I hope to see you in person next year. I hope that um, things are better and that you can be in Miami and you can bring your thing you've built and maybe we'll sponsor another build from you uh, for sure I definitely, yes. I definitely want to have you and Ali I mean and Sophie and and uh and Stephanie and all you guys all together in, in, in a space uh, and definitely want you to meet Andrea this time here she's dying to meet you also and dying to meet the rest of the team from uh you know uh, from Witch Doctor and we have a whole bunch of folks that just you know that want to follow you again I will be posting all the videos we talked about the mask video all of Ali's um YouTube channels everything in her chat so after this, after this talk, if you go back to the chat, I'll post all those things inside the app for the chat. Uh, any last words of inspiration for everybody out there? Uh, I don't know. Um, just, uh, 
I guess I'm going to leave you with uh, something about making. So, um, oh my goodness, my mind is just blank now. <laughs> Um, so I guess a lot of people, when they think about making and inventing, they think about, you know, when you're coming up with an invention idea, solving, you know, huge world problems like curing cancer or ending world hunger. And although those are very noble causes and uh, things that should be solved, uh, not every single invention is going to, you know, solve everybody's problems. You could just have a problem that only you have. Like, I didn't like uh, three ring binders for school which we were uh, required to have. I, I really liked backpacks. And so I came up with an invention that turned a three ring binder into a wearable backpack kind of thing with a removable strap. So even though you know it was only a problem that I had, uh, it ended up changing my everyday life and improving my life for the better. So if you have the drive to solve the problem, then obviously it's the right problem for you to solve and you can make something for it. Awesome. Thank you everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, thank you for coming online. I hope that everybody comes to see Ali and Sophie and Stephanie and Jen talk later on the panel. And as soon as this, this talk is done here, we'll be starting the Jen panel in about 15 minutes. So I'd love to see you on the Jen panel too. Bye, Ali. Bye, everybody. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you.